The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Now we are going to uh, I'm going to give a little talk, uh, and uh, the one of the things I want to emphasize or talk about today is uh, uh, something that is quite close to me uh, right now. Uh, very often, when you give a Dhamma talk, you want to give a talk about something which is topical, uh, something which is on your mind, because uh, that's just natural. Yeah, it's on your mind, so you talk about it. Uh, makes life easier. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's uh, kind of been on my mind over the last few weeks is the fact that my father passed away about four weeks ago now. Uh, and uh, that's kind of, you know, for most people is a big event. It is something that you kind of, you know, sears into your memory a little bit. Uh, and uh, often for many people it's quite traumatic when someone close to you passes away. Uh, so for me it was very interesting because, uh, you know, as a Buddhist monk you're supposed to have contemplated things like death uh, or ideally over many years, uh, many decades, uh, as even if you've been a monk for a long time. Uh, so uh, because of that you really find out whether your contemplations have worked or not. Yeah? Does, has it had any impact on you? Have you benefited from these contemplations? Uh, are you able to deal with things that are difficult uh, generally for people, are you able to deal with it in a way that is more in accordance with the Dhamma, whereby you can see things in a slightly different way. Uh, and uh, I must admit I was quite pleased, you never know before the events happen, you think that you have kind of contemplated these things in the right way, but it's hard to know before the kind of the events happen, uh, and that's when you get a test. Uh, so it's good to get a test sometimes, uh, otherwise you kind of, you practice along the path and you kind of you don't really know what, whether you are succeeding or not. Uh, actually life is full of tests really, so it's not as if you have to look for those tests. Yeah, Tests come really in small doses every day, uh, but sometimes they come in really big doses when someone passes away and these things. Uh, so it was, uh, for me it was therefore uh, very interesting and uh, I realized that my contemplation of death had really been worthwhile and I compared my own reaction to the reaction of many others, like my family members especially, and the usual reaction when people pass away, and this was also in the case of my mother, for example, of course, for my mother it would have been far more difficult than for me uh, because of living together with someone for so many decades, yeah, over 60 years, uh, and that's a long time. Uh, so, uh, but um, uh, still, I could see the difference in reaction there, also for my siblings and other family members, uh, and very often people say things like, oh, it happened so quickly, uh, it happened so soon, uh, I wasn't really expecting, I wasn't really ready for it, uh, yeah, I hadn't kind of done the things, said the things I wanted to say before someone passes away. Uh, and uh, this has, is a kind of a recurring theme when people pass away that I have noticed so often. Uh, people say, it happened to so quickly, uh, it kind of came out of the blue. Uh, yeah? But this is precisely the point, that's exactly how death tends to happen, it comes out of the blue. Uh, and this is why it surprises us, it's very rare that it happens in a very orderly way. Actually, even when it happens in a kind of the orderly way, still people say it happens too quickly. Uh, Kind of the orderly way is okay. You get really, really old. Then you go to hospital, and you kind of, you kind of deteriorate and gradually, and then eventually you pass away. And still, people say, "Oh, I didn't really expect it. I thought it would hang in there one more day." He, he's dying. What do you mean he didn't expect it? <laughs> so obvious, yeah. But still, kind of, we, it's hard to take it fully on board that someone actually is passing away. So, and this is uh, one of those things, of course. One of the points of this is that you. Um, want to uh, take this on board in such a way from the very beginning uh, that you actually can when it happens. It doesn't seem as a surprise, yeah? It's more like you expect it to happen. Uh, and this was what happened to me when I got the phone call, my father died. I thought, yeah, I kind of I expected that uh, because I had made that such a powerful kind of imprint in my mind uh, that uh, when he died, he died that was it. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I try to do that with everybody uh, yeah, in my life, with everyone I meet, everyone I know. I try to make it clear to me that I may never see this person again. Uh, this may be the last time. Uh, I try to make it clear about myself as well. Uh, I could also die at any time. Uh, yeah? And there's something very beautiful that comes out of that. If you remember that someone can pass, at, pass away at any time uh, and that you may never see them again, uh, what it means is that you treat people well. Uh, 
How, how can you, if you're never going to see someone again, uh, how will you treat them? Uh, would you treat them by being angry or negative or saying something bad the last time you see somebody? Uh, it's almost inconceivable. Uh, if, you, if I know that I may never see you again, then I will try to treat, treat you with kindness, uh, with a degree of compassion, to say something nice, that when we depart from each other, we feel good about it. And then we can separate, and there's no regrets, there's no problems, uh, and then we can move on in our lives on our separate journeys. But if we do something which is not nice, it is actually often difficult to move on. It's as if we're tied to the past, tied to the past, through that bad action, because it lingers in our memory. And that lingering in your memory, that is a tie, that is a fetter that binds you to the past and you can't really let go. And then mindfulness becomes difficult. It becomes difficult to live your life fully in the present moment. And all of these things, they make, make things far more difficult as a consequence. So for me, it had been very useful because I remember these things and I realized that I had to kind of make peace with my father and I tried to do that many, many years ago. It is always the case when you grow up in a family, there's always a degree of friction in the people who are nearest to you. And I realized I wanted to make good for anything that had happened in the past. So I spent a large part of my, uh, when I was with my parents, always trying to live up to the highest standard with my parents. And that had a very powerful impact, actually. It was one of those uh, very interesting things uh, that... Uh, do you disagree with what I'm saying? Uh, are you <laughs> He's complaining. <laughs> Not sure, right? It's, it's, you're still a bit young to contemplate death. I recognize that. Uh, <laughs> but it, ha it has a very interesting impact on your uh, parents and your family members when you kind of turn around like that and before you've had kind of a more ordinary relationship and then you realize that how you deal with your parents is so impactful on your practice. You may remember, and I always like to bring this up when I read the suttas, but in the uh, sutta, the very first part of the Noble Eightfold Path, of course, you have right view. And one of the definitions, one of the aspects of right view is, it says quite cryptically, there is a mother and father. Yeah, and uh, I think now someone, I think Adan Sudato translates it as that you have responsibilities towards mother and father. Huh? And when you see that, you think, what does this actually mean? There is mother and father. Huh? But you realize it is an aspect of right view, and it is always framed in the context of karma and rebirth. Huh? And you realize that actually how you treat your parents is a very important part of the Noble Eightfold Path. Huh? If you do it in the right way, it enhances your practice dramatically. Huh? So that, and a recollection of death and all of these things together, uh, made me realize I need to do something with this. Uh, and I did. Uh, I, st I stopped trying to proselytize, yeah, I, start I stopped trying to say to my parents, yeah, Buddhism is the best, you know, forget everything else you, you believe in, become Buddhist. I, I stopped saying that because I realized that's, that doesn't work, you can't say that to your parents. Uh, so instead I started to act. I started to walk instead of talking. I forgot, don't, you know, don't even walk to talk, don't even talk at all, just walk. Yeah? That's kind of the point here. <clears throat> so I tried to walk. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, when you walk, and when you do the right thing, uh, something magic happens, uh, something dramatic happens. Uh, even though my parents were very disappointed and very against it when I became a monk. Uh, yeah, surprise, surprise. Have you, most parents are like that, yeah? <laughs> don't become a monk, no, please. We didn't bring you up for this purpose. Uh, <laughs> oh, everybody gets to hear that. Most people get to hear that when they decide to become a monastic. But I was stubborn, and I'm very glad I was stubborn. It was the right thing to be stubborn about. And what happens over time is that uh, something happens in your parents' hearts. Uh, they start to understand that you're doing something very, very positive. Uh, that in fact, everything else you could do in life actually kind of pales in significance uh, by being a monastic. Uh, especially if you live your monastic life well. Uh, they start to see there's something very powerful, very meaningful, very useful. Uh, useful not only for their son, uh, but also for them after a while. Yeah, when you talk to them, you have good conversations together, you talk about meaningful things instead of gossiping and talking about all kind of nonsense. And it's also good for other people, it's good for everyone. It's one of those fundamental things that makes something into a spiritual quality, is that it is good not only for you, but also for the other people around you. When that comes together, it is a spiritual quality. And then, as, you, as I try to live up to these standards, uh, the standards about how to treat your parents in the right way, thinking of them as your uh, initial teachers, thinking, thinking of them as Brahma, uh, 
Yeah, these are all taken from the suttas. This is how the Buddha recommends we should think about our parents. Uh, thinking about your parents as Brahma means that you reflect on them as being those who have the most loving kindness towards you, uh, just like Brahma has loving kindness. Uh, and then as you do that, there's this gradual transformation uh, from being very against what you're doing, uh, starting to take an interest, uh, and eventually realize that you are doing what really is important in life. And then uh, they come to you and they ask you, this happened to my father, yeah, and my mother, and my brother, and uh, finally also my sister, she was the last holdout. Uh, eventually <laughs> my sister also came, came on board, uh, and they ask, for, you know, teach me some Meditation, teach me something about Buddhism, teach me something about what you're doing. And when I used to meet with my family in recent years, whenever we come together, I would give them a Dhamma talk and I would give, we, would, we would have meditation together. Yeah? And they would all kind of take these things on board to varying degrees, not everything of course, but to varying degrees. And it came to the point, what my father said to me, he said that I used to be your teacher, now you're my teacher. <laughs> This is very powerful, yeah, and it's very beautiful. And the outcome, the reason why that happened, uh, is because that uh, you live these things in the right way. You remember death. It came out in large part because of death contemplation. I've got to do something now. There may never be a chance again to say the words that are right, to do the right things. Uh, let me take the opportunity now. And I did that, uh, and it worked. Uh, and of course, when that happens, when you, you feel that you have done everything you can, you have remembered death, then when death finally happens, there are no regrets. There's no sense that anything was left undone. I've done everything I can. So for that reason, it was, for me, it was fine, it was good. And not, not only that, it was another uh, important aspect to this death as well, and that was the fact that my father was generally a good person. Uh, my father had been a very successful businessman, uh, and uh, sometimes if you are a successful businessman, you may kind of become a bit conceited. Yeah, you made a really. He started out in very simple, in a very simple life, and he ended up quite a well-off man. Yeah, he had done everything kind of really well in his life, uh, and. Um, uh, sometimes you get conceited, uh, but he actually didn't, and he was still open to new ideas, which he showed through kind of his uh, leaning towards Buddhism towards the end of his life. Uh, and for him, he was a good man, uh, he lived a good life, uh, he brought up his children in a good way, he even allowed them to become a Buddhist monk, that was pretty amazing, yeah? <laughs> it wasn't ideal, but he allowed it anyway. And, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, after you, when you look at a life like that, uh, why feel sad? It's a life well lived. Yeah, they've done your best with this existence. You have had a chance to live this life for a few years. You've done your very best with it. So why be too sad about that? Instead, rejoice. And that was one of the things that was interesting because I, I was in charge of my own father's funeral service, which was very nice. It's a nice way of sending your dad off into the future and thanking him for all the things. And we did that. It was a large crowd present. And, uh, uh, and I did it in a kind of Buddhist way, in an uplifting way, nothing too sad. Nobody was crying at this funeral, which is amazing. Yeah? In, a, in a kind of Western country where you have a Christian culture, you're supposed to cry. People are supposed to be sad. Nobody was sad. Yeah? There was no crying. Even my mother didn't cry. And she was, that was kind of astonishing. Yeah? And, uh, so, uh, uh, and afterwards people said, wow, that was the best funeral service we have ever been to before in our entire life. Uh, yeah? Because usually we just feel sad and depressed, but now we felt actually uplifted and inspired by funeral service. Uh, so I, you, know, you recognize that there's something to these Buddhist ideas, uh, the Buddhist approach to life, when it is taken seriously and fully on board, uh, that is very powerful. Uh, and people in secular cultures, uh, uh, and many Western cultures are becoming very secularized. It's true of Australia, it's true of lots of European cultures, uh, especially Northern Europe. Uh, and uh, in those cultures, uh, they often need something more, they need something additional, and here, Buddhism has something beautiful to add, and it always uh, reminds me, these were people, there was over 200 people present for that funeral, people had no idea about Buddhism at all, and all they did was kind of speak common sense, yeah, ordinary things, and yet they were inspired by it. Uh, it shows you that there is a lack there, uh, and often all we have to do as Buddhists uh, is to present the Buddhist message in a way that is palatable, that is easy to understand, uh, and people will come to accept it, because it is really just common sense, uh, yeah, there's nothing kind of, uh, I mean, there are aspects of Buddhism that go beyond common sense, of course, uh, but uh, uh, a lot of it is just common sense, common psychology, a common an outlook that is sensible to the majority of people if they uh, think about life carefully. 
Of course, you have to have an interest in life, you have to have an interest in a, a kind of uh, what the purpose of life is and all of these kind of things. Uh, but a lot of people have that, uh, and they are open to these sort of things. Uh. So it was a very interesting uh, experience to me, and it kind of sounds maybe strange saying that, that your father's passing away is interesting. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, because uh, it, uh, when you think about it in the right way, uh, it actually is, uh, uh, it enhances your life. It makes, some, makes it something, it makes something about it which actually gives it more value uh, because of the right way, the right outlook that you have. Uh. And uh, what is uh, also interesting, because I always like to kind of bring these things back to the suttas uh, and how the Buddha talks about these things. Uh, and one of the stories about the Buddha, the Buddha also passed away, obviously. Uh, and uh, the story of how the Buddha passed away in many ways kind of encapsulated the general problems with passing away and how we should look upon life. Uh, and the story of the Buddha's passing away is found, as many of you would know, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the great discourse on the Buddha's uh, passing away. Uh, it's a very beautiful sutta. And if you have any interest in the word of the Buddha, I would really recommend you to read that sutta because there are so many valuable lessons in that particular sutta. Uh, the purpose of the sutta, of course, is the Buddha knows that he's about to pass away. Uh, and he goes on this long walk starting in Rajagaha, the capital of the Magadan kingdom. And he walks all the way to Kushinara, which is, uh, how far is that? Four, five hundred kilometers maybe, something like that. Uh, it's a long way to go by foot. And uh, he does that, and of course, because he knows, especially towards the end, that he is about to pass away, uh, the Mahapanibbana Sutta is where he kind of lays down uh, what is the essence of his teachings. Yeah? He tells the monks, this is what you should remember, this is what I've been really teaching. Yeah? So lots of interesting information like that. Uh, also, he explains to the crowd, explains to the people uh, how they should live without him, uh, yeah? how they can kind of carry on without him. Uh, so a lot of information there, practical information about how to carry on in the future. Uh. And of course, that's relevant for us now because we are that future. Yeah, here we are. Uh, we are the future from the viewpoint of the suttas. Uh, yeah? And so for us, it is incredibly relevant, many of the things that you find in the Mahapanibbana Sutta. You get direct information about how we are supposed to live, how we're supposed to think about the Dhamma, how we're supposed to organize ourselves, yeah? so that we can carry on with this uh, beautiful teaching that was bequeathed us from the Buddha himself. Yeah? So this is all that is happening in the sutta. And then, of course, towards the very end, the Buddha spends one of his last, uh, actually the last rains retreat uh, in Vesali. Uh, Vesali being the capital of the Vajian kingdom, uh, like a confederacy. It was almost like an de early democracy at that time. Uh, and during this rains retreat in Vesali, the Buddha has some very serious illnesses. Uh, yeah, and Venerable Ananda, who is his attendant, he looks at the Buddha. Huh? And when he looks at the Buddha and he sees that the Buddha is so uncomfortable, huh? he kind of loses his sense of his bearings. He says, it's as if I'm drunk. Yeah, my sense of directions is completely lost. Because Venerable Ananda has been the Buddha's attendant for 20 years, uh, been with the Buddha pr probably almost every day for those 20 years, uh, memorizing the suttas, uh, understanding the Dhamma fully. Uh, yeah? So for him, it, you can imagine that it would be a very hard thing when the Buddha is about to pass away. Uh. And then he says to the Buddha that uh, uh, my only consolation was that, uh, of course, you, you would... Uh, master, you would say something to the Sangha and you would say something to everyone before you pass away. Uh, and uh, this is where it becomes interesting. Yeah? Uh, uh, first of all, the Buddha has to use energy uh, to kind of uh, get out of that illness. Uh, in other words, he has to try to overcome that illness. Uh, it is very obvious that the Buddha is getting older here. It's very obvious he talks about his body being like a cart that is falling apart. Uh, it's almost as if it has to be held together by straps like an old cart, uh, and his body is a bit like that. Uh. And this in its own right is quite interesting and an important point, and maybe I should just say a little bit about that. Uh, 
because one of the things is that when you read the suttas, there's two different pictures that emerges of the Buddha when you read the suttas. And one is the very naturalistic picture of the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha as an ordinary human being whose body is falling apart, who is getting old like everyone else, and who gets sick, and who has all the kind of ordinary bodily problems and bodily things as everyone else has. And he's as a way on, on, he's on his way to passing away. And uh, that is kind of one side of the Buddha. And then there's the other side of the Buddha, which is slightly more supernatural. Yeah? And for example, one of the classic examples of that supernatural part of the Buddha is when he says in the Mahaparibbana Sutta that uh, he could live on for the eon if he wants to. Huh? That's kind of a bit strange, isn't it? How can you live on for the eon? If you have an ordinary human body, it would seem completely madness to even try to live on for an eon. Imagine what this body is like after even a hundred years, it's falling apart. If you think about what it would be like after an eon, it would be like a nightmare. Yeah, you don't even want to dream about it because it would be so terrible. <laughs> so, uh, what is, who is the real Buddha? And it seems obvious to me that when you read the suttas, especially when you do a bit of comparative study, which is kind of in vogue these days, at least in certain circles, and you compare the suttas across various recensions and all of these things, it is fairly clear in my mind that the real Buddha is the naturalistic Buddha, the Buddha who was a human being and he had a physical body just like the rest of us, and there's no way he could live on for the eon. And there are many reasons to think that that idea that the Buddha could live for an eon is actually not really correct. And I'm not going to go into that now because it's too much of a sidetrack, but just to mention that. And very many of the more supernatural elements in the suttas, perhaps not all, but many of them have that kind of problems with them. Remember the Buddha, he actually said somewhere that he detests supernatural phenomena. Yeah, and of course, if he detests them, it's very unlikely that he will be exhibiting them or asking his monks to do so. Huh? So the Buddha is a person. He's one of us. Yeah? And he, although he has purified his mind to the highest extent, uh, and in that sense he is different from us, he's mentally purified, uh, in that sense he's different, uh, still he comes from the same root. Uh, he has the same kind of body. He's essentially a human being. Yeah? And this is a very useful thing to remember, because when you remember that, uh, it makes the Buddha's teaching so much more relevant to us. Uh, yeah, if the Buddha is somehow out of reach, if he is a different kind of being than we are, uh, actually his relevance to our life is much more uh, debatable. Uh, but because he is a human being, uh, which means that he understands exactly what we are like, because he's been through the same problems, uh, suddenly his teachings are so relevant to us as well. Uh. So think of the Buddha in that way, and I think it is far more useful for, um, uh, for our practice and for actually developing the Buddha Nusati and the whole path, uh, because it makes the whole thing more easy to grasp, more kind of natural and more relatable than it otherwise would be. Uh, little things like that can make a big difference and big impact. Uh, too many people treat the Buddha as some kind of god, yeah, some people go and pray to the Buddha, please give me a new BMW, I need a new BMW. That is, a, that is the wrong way to treat the Buddha. It, <laughs> yeah, so please don't do that. So this is one of the first things that comes out of this. Yeah, the Buddha is natural, he is also subject to old age, he will have to die. And towards the very end he specifically says, I have to kind of rouse up energy to enable to sustain my life a little further. Yeah. And then he has all these other things that he says around this time. Yeah, many interesting things that I won't go into in great detail. Uh, but he talks about at this stage about having no teacher's fist. Yeah, the acharya muti, teacher's fist, which means that you hold a certain information back. Yeah, you don't actually give out all the dhamma. You hold something back to kind of create a, you know, something mystic, mystic esoteric, yeah, secret teaching, that kind of stuff. Uh, he doesn't have that. There are no secret teachings in Buddhism. Uh, it's a very useful thing to remember because sometimes uh, in Buddhist circles, that's exactly sometimes what you find. Yeah, you find kind of secret teachings. Uh, and once you hear about that, you know, actually, this goes against the principles of how the Buddha himself taught. Uh, he says he has no inner and outer. Uh, yeah, there is no kind of inner circle of favorite disciples uh, and then those on the outer trying to get into that inner circle. Uh, Sometimes it is like that when you have a kind of cultish 
uh, type of leadership. Yeah? You have like a, the close disciples uh, and everyone else wants to kind of get into that inner ring of disciples. Yeah? So you kind of create this craving, this kind of uh, feeling of there's something special going on uh, and everyone else trying to get in there. Uh, but that is not how the Buddha operated. Uh, there is no inner and outer. Uh, he treats everyone in the same way, roughly. Of course, he looks at your spiritual qualities and he uh, teaches you a little bit according to that, but generally he treats people in the same way. Uh, there are no favorite disciples. Uh, there is no one who is kind of given that special treatment. Uh, everyone is the same. And what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, what a wonderful example that is. Uh, we tend to treat people differently depending on who are our favorites and these kind of things. Uh, one of the things I also always notice about someone like Ajahn Brahm, who is my teacher, of course, uh, he always treats people the same. Uh, yeah, you never get special treatment from Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and if you want special treatment, find another teacher. You're not going to get it from Ajahn Brahm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you should never look for that special treatment anyway. If you look for it, you're looking for the wrong thing. Uh, it shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't have special treatment. Everyone should be, we should feel that we are on the same level. That is the appropriate way of practicing this Dhamma. Yeah? And that leaves a sense of independence for each one of us also. So it's a very positive thing when it happens in that way. And the Buddha also said that this particular point, he says that he is asked, well, who should lead the community after you passed away? And the Buddha says, well, I don't even consider myself a leader. Yeah? So let alone, why should I kind of make anyone else a leader? Kind of interesting, what do you mean you don't consider yourself a leader? Everyone looks to you for all the solutions. Well, for the Buddha's point of view, because he has no sense of self and no sense of being anyone special, he is just there, he just solves issues and he kind of does things in the right way, but he doesn't have any personal sense or personal identity as a leader. He may be looked as a leader on the outside, but personally he doesn't feel that way. And now he says, in the future, there should be no leader in the Sangha. The Sangha should be a decentralized body that relies on the Dhamma and the Vinaya, these teachings, to carry on into the future. And that Dhamma and Vinaya is still available to us to the present day. That is our teacher. And that is one reason why I like to quote the suttas, which is exactly what I'm doing now, by the way, just to make that absolutely clear. I'm just kind of recounting what is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. But uh, the main point of all of this, I'm just kind of bringing these up because they are very interesting points that happen in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. I'm trying to sell it to you a little bit uh, so that when you go back home afterwards, you want to look it up straight away. Uh. Yeah? So this is what salesmen are supposed to do. And if, <laughs> and if you don't look it up, I have failed as a salesman. So that's kind of my... <laughs> So it is quite hard to get people to read the suttas because people don't have time, sometimes the language is a bit foreign, yeah? so you have to really kind of try your best. It's good to start when you're young very often. Yeah? So, um, uh, but the main point here is that the Buddha is moving towards his final destination in this life. Uh, he's about to pass away. Ananda is distraught. Yeah? He cannot really deal with this whole thing. Yeah? So then uh, the Buddha says to Ananda, uh, yeah, he'd realize Ananda is so distraught, he says to him, uh, but haven't I told you uh, that everything that is dear and pleasing to you must become otherwise, uh, must become separated from you? Uh, and, uh, and of course this later on becomes one of those core teachings of the Buddha, something that you see in the suttas uh, and what the Buddha specifically says, that whether you are a lay person or a monastic, whether you are a woman or a man, this is one of those core things that we should remember at all times. Uh, yeah? Everything in your life that is dear and pleasing to you must become separated from you. Uh, and uh, that, of course, is a very powerful thing, because when you start to think about it, there are so many things in this world that potentially either they are dear and pleasing to you, or potentially could become dear and pleasing to you. Huh? And the more you reflect on it, the more you realize that actually this entire world of sensory, sensory existence, uh, where we see, we hear, we feel, we smell and we taste, that whole world in a sense is that area where we become attached, where we hold on, and where things become dear and agreeable to us. Uh. So the Buddha then says, well, what is the solution to this? Uh, how, should we, uh, how should we deal with this? Uh? And what he says is that you have to be uh, you'd have to be a refuge for yourself. You have to take the Dhamma as a refuge, and you should have no other refuge apart from that. 
Yeah, a refuge for yourself, a refuge in the Dhamma. So you have to have an inner refuge. That's what the Buddha is saying. If the whole external world is unreliable, and that's basically what he's saying, yeah, the whole external world is unreliable. And if you think about it clearly, you know that's true. Yeah, you think about things in your life, they all pass away, they all disappear. At the very latest, when you die, very often, long before that, it is so inherently unreliable. You don't know what's going to happen next. It's going to let you down. That is all you know. So there's only one place you can find that refuge, and that is within yourself. And that is what it means to be an island unto yourself, or being your own island. With the support of the Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha, to then kind of guide you in that process of being an island unto yourself, then you have the two pillars that make a real refuge possible. Remember that whenever you live uh, your life and you see that you become disappointed with something or you become distraught or you suffer because of something that happens in the external world, uh, the reason why you become distraught, uh, the reason why you suffer, uh, the reason why it's difficult to take is because you have taken refuge in that world. Uh, you have taken refuge in the sense that you expect certain outcomes. Uh, you expect people to live. Uh, you expect uh, you, you work to be there, you, just, you don't expect to be fired, you expect your kids to behave in a certain way, you expect your parents to behave in a certain way, yeah? you expect people to look after the environment, you expect certain politicians to do the right thing. Yeah? Whenever you see the politicians or the environment going down the drain, you, you get upset. Why? Because we had different expectations. Every time something goes wrong in our life, every time we get upset about something, every time you can't take the impermanence, you have taken refuge in that world, yeah? because you had expectations of it. You want it to go in a certain way, forgetting that the world is out of control. The world is always going to let you down. So you have to find the inner refuge instead. And how do you do that? And this is where the Buddha says that the way to be an island unto yourself, the way to use the Dhamma as a refuge, is to practice the four Satipatthanas. Yeah, and the four Satipatthanas is, can be summarized in one way just as mindfulness of breathing, yeah, watching your breath and going using meditation as, an, uh, as a refuge. Why is that a refuge? Because when you go within and when you practice meditation to a deep level, and Satipatthana is already quite a deep level, you are going inside of yourself. You are allowing the senses to gradually drop off. The external world starts to disappear. And instead, you find that solace. You find that peace. You find the joy and all of these things within and inside of yourself. And the more you have access to that, the more you have access to these inner positive things, the less reliant you are on the external world for your happiness, for your peace and for meaning and all of these other things. This is why meditation is so powerful. It gives you a refuge in a world that is usually without a real refuge. And uh, I, I always like that one of the things that uh, uh, Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Shah, of course, Ajahn Brahm's teacher, in case you don't know, uh, uh, very famous, one of the perhaps the most famous of all the meditation masters in Thailand in the 20th century. Uh, and he said that uh, going into meditation, deep meditation especially, that's your real home. That is your home, because there, that is where you feel really safe, and you feel uh, you have a refuge from the entire world, which is so unreliable, so uncertain, and that will always let you down in the end. So finding that refuge within is really a very important part of what the Buddhist teachings are about. And uh, perhaps you think that is a high ask, yeah, because many people who are Buddhist they may not meditate very much. They might may find meditation difficult. They might find it difficult to give rise to joy or even peace in the meditation. So what do we do then if we can't do that? Well, remember that. Anything you do in the Buddhist path, even if it's just being kind, keeping the five precepts, we just did the five precepts, yeah, it's wonderful, most people here seem to be keeping them, which is a marvelous thing. It is not at all obvious that people should be keeping the five precepts, but people here seem to do it, and that's marvelous. And all of these things uh, that we do, uh, the kindness that we give out to other people, uh, the compassion that we have for the world, uh, the metta that we have for others, uh, all of that, uh, every time you do that, you are creating a little bit of refuge within yourself. Uh, why is that? Because when we do things that have to do with kindness, that have to do with uh, all of these things, we are building up a sense of contentment uh, and happiness within ourselves. Uh, 
And you know that's true, yeah? You know it's true that if you really do an act of kindness towards other people, uh, you tend to feel good about yourself. Uh, if you're anything like me, and I assure you, you, you are, because we're all the same, uh, yeah, I, I, I really like to say that because people don't really want to be exactly the same as others. We all, always want to have a little bit of self. Yeah, this is me. I'm a bit like this. I'm different. Uh, I'm different. Actually, we're all the same. Yeah? So, <laughs> because of that, uh, when you do an act of kindness, you will feel good about yourself. Uh, sometimes you may not feel it. It may be kind of a little bit subliminal, a bit kind of below the threshold of what you can perceive. Uh, but sometimes you feel it powerfully. You don't know, at what kind of you feel really good about yourself. But all the time we are building up this underlying thing where we feel that we are living a worthy life. We are building up self-esteem, building up a sense of feeling good about ourselves. And that is where that refuge comes. Because that goodness is independent of external phenomena. It is a spiritual kind of happiness, a spiritual kind of peace that we are building up for ourselves. And then down the track, if you continue doing that, uh, eventually you will also be able to meditate because these things go hand in hand very closely. Yeah. So this is the Buddha's answer. If the world is so unreliable, uh, if things are so uncertain, we need something else in our lives. We need a spiritual part in our lives, something where we can find a true refuge. Uh, this is why we have the triple refuge in Buddhism yeah, that we talked about, that we actually chanted just before. Uh, and for people who don't have this, uh, for people who don't have any spiritual leanings, who are just materialists in the world, the world is very dry. The world is like a desert, the Buddha says. You're going through this desert. You have, there's nothing to really nourish you. You feel a sense of emptiness, purposeless, meaningless. You're moving towards your death, and then when you die, that's the end of everything. And all you did in the meantime was kind of just running around chasing empty pleasures. Kind of silly. And really, it's kind of meaningless at the end of the day. Yeah. So, so wonderful, so fortunate everyone is who has that kind of purpose in life, something else to give life meaning yeah, and to give life uh, 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 some kind of worthy goal and aim. But there is more to this idea of uh, dying and to the idea of impermanence. And uh, uh, I'm just now talking about the end of the Buddha's life, how to think about it. Uh, but actually, this idea of death and impermanence also comes in at the very beginning, uh, at the beginning of the Buddha's search for awakening. Yeah? So it is the conclusion of everything, but also it's part of the beginning of everything, which is perhaps more surprising. Uh, what has death got to do with the beginning of things? Uh, and uh, uh, the answer to that is that when the Buddha was growing up, as you know, the story of the Buddha, this is not just a legend, but actually this is a, what is actually, you get from the suttas, this seems to be a real historical account of how the Buddha grew up. And he grew up in a, what we would consider a wealthy family at that time. He wasn't a prince, he didn't grow up in kind of great, incredible luxury, anything like that, but still, to a very high degree of luxury and material well-being, uh, considering the times. Yeah? He didn't, of course, he didn't have any of the modern trappings of luxury, but he had some of the ancient trappings of luxury. You know what they were, ancient trappings of luxury? They were lotus ponds. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It actually says in the suttas, the Buddha had three lotus ponds, one with uh, blue lotuses, one with red lotuses, and one with white lotuses. Yeah? So that was when he was growing up. So that's how the young men enjoyed themselves at the time of the Buddha. They had lotus ponds. It's kind of, su kind of sweet, isn't it? <laughs> These days, things have changed just a little bit, uh, and uh, we don't really enjoy those lotus ponds quite the same way we did two and a half thousand years ago. And uh, what else did he have to enjoy himself? He had, uh, he had very nice clothes, yeah? clothes made of the highest kind of cotton that was available, high quality cloth from Benares. Yeah? So his turban, his jacket, and what he was wearing was made of that kind of cloth. Uh, and then he had servants looking after him, and he had three houses. Uh, that's kind of high luxury, three houses and one for the, each of the seasons. Uh, maybe they were built differently according to the weather or whatever, I don't know. Uh, so he grew up in luxury. Uh, and uh, amid all that luxury that he had, uh, uh, one day he started to reflect about the realities of life. Uh, and this is found in a number of suttas. One of the most important ones is the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, which translates as the Noble Sutta on the Noble Search. Yeah, the Noble Search being the search, of course, for awakening and enlightenment. Uh, it's also found in the uh, Anguttara 3s uh, in a sutta called the uh, Sukumala Sutta, which means like uh, being, Sukumala means like uh, uh, 
refined or, or fine or something like that. You've been brought up in a refined way, sukkuma, suk sukkumala, I think it is. Uh, and uh, uh, in the sutta, especially the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, where the Buddha talks about the noble search, uh, he says that while he was living this life, it occurred to him uh, yeah, that I'm going to have to die here. Yeah, I, in the middle of all this, I'm kind of enjoying all of these things, but one day I'm going to have to die from this. Uh, so what does that mean? Does that mean that I should just keep on clinging and attaching to all of these things, and then when I die I'm going to have to suffer the consequences? Uh, what does that actually mean? But not only is it the fact that I am going to die, but all of these things around me that I am attaching to, yeah, a wife and children, uh, uh, all my possessions that I have, uh, uh, and it kind of counts up all the possessions that I have, yeah, the cattle, the animals, the gold and the silver, all of these kind of things, that too is subject to death. Uh, and that, of course, because it's all subject to death, uh, and uh, Gold and silver is subject to death in the sense that it will disappear one day. Because it is all subject to death, it may depart even before I die. So how can I go around when these things are so unreliable and so uncertain? How can I go around attaching to these things, enjoying them, making this the foundation of my life, and then down the track stare suffering in the face? Because that has to be the end point of all of this. And this is what this kind of reflection, the reflection on death, is the fundamental one that makes the Buddha decide to go forth. Isn't that kind of astonishing? You may have heard the story of the Buddha deciding he has compassion for all living beings, he wants to find a solution to the problems of the world, yeah, and he practices for four incalculable eons or whatever, and then as a bodhisattva, and then he decides to become a Buddha. Well, that is a story. It is a nice story, perhaps, but it's just a story. It is not actually, uh, ha doesn't have anything to do with what actually happens, what, what, sorry, with what actually happened. Yeah, this is a story that was built up after the Buddha passed away, in large part because people wanted to remember the Buddha and they wanted to kind of understand who he was as a being. And it came in after the life of the Buddha. There's a very nice book called The Genesis of the Bodhisattva Ideal. And it talks about the foundations of this ideal, how it arose based on certain passages in the suttas. And if you read that uh, little booklet, it's about 100 pages long or something, uh, you will never look at the Bodhisattva idea in quite the same way afterwards. Uh, it's very well researched and very uh, worthy of reading. Uh. So the reality is that the reason why the Buddha was forth, what the Buddha himself says, uh, as far as we know from the earliest suttas, uh, this was the reason. Uh. Death is what actually motivated the Buddha to go out. That is how powerful a recollection death actually is. Uh. So the reason why death does not sometimes drive us on so much in the spiritual practice as it should is because we haven't contemplated it quite to the extent that the Buddha did. Yeah, we still haven't taken it on board fully in the way that the Buddha suggested we should. So uh, the Buddha, seeing all of this, uh, that all this clinging and holding on to these things, yeah, is actually really problematic. Uh, there's two things here which are kind of interesting. One thing is that you cling on to all of these things in life and it causes suffering. Uh, but the other thing which is interesting, and this is kind of the Buddha's other understanding, I think, here, it doesn't even give all that much happiness. Uh, yeah, it doesn't give any profound sense of satisfaction. Uh, all the worldly things that we have, uh, they give us a degree of happiness uh, and enough to kind of carry on, but not the profound sense of happiness that you can find in meditation uh, experiences, for example. Uh, so it's kind of weird. We cling on to all of these things, uh, while well, at the same time, these things can never give us real happiness. Uh, what are we doing? We're just causing suffering for ourselves and not experiencing happiness. Uh, it's kind of r really a bad idea, isn't it? Uh, so the Buddha goes forth. Uh, and then based on that, based on that insight, uh, uh, then eventually he, he makes the breakthrough uh, and becomes a Buddha down the track uh, and then teaches us these teachings uh, and then uh, bequeaths this beautiful Dhamma for generations of uh, people in different cultures, different times, uh, for two and a half thousand years into the future. And all of that uh, came about because the Buddha, or the Buddha-to-be, thought about death in a profound way. Uh, you could argue that the whole of Buddhism, the whole of these teachings, uh, emerged from the idea of death. And that is very interesting, because it shows you some of the potential for this kind of reflection. Yeah? It shows you how powerful it actually can be. Yeah? So if you do it in the right way, it really becomes something very powerful in your mind. Uh, you're going to die. What does that mean? Uh, 
take it on board fully, and then this is the consequence of that. But one way, so that, that is uh, kind of how this ties in uh, with uh, the suttas. Uh, and uh, it uh, can be argued, I think, that this uh, idea of death is really just uh, uh, one contemplation of a broader contemplation. Uh, and that broader contemplation is that everything in the world is impermanent, unsatisfactory, always changing. Death is the starkest expression of that. Uh, when you stare death kind of in the face, it's a very powerful reminder of impermanence because everything has to go. Uh, but actually, it is a more general idea that everything is impermanent. Yeah, This is kind of the general idea which incorporates the idea of death. Uh, everything is always a bit out of control and a bit uncertain. Uh, and even though it is a bit out of control and uncertain, uh, and at the same time it doesn't really give any real satisfaction either, uh, uh, when you pursue all of these things in the world, they are kind of nice, uh, but you never really feel truly satisfied. Uh, you never feel truly complete uh, because of these things. Uh, there is a, a kind of always that endless searching for more uh, that never really stops. Uh. So in concluding this talk, uh, I thought it would be good to look at one of the beautiful similes that the Buddha uses to explain this, uh, yeah, and how that eventually, if you pursue that idea, eventually it gives rise to that real satisfaction and real contentment on the Buddha's path. Uh, and this simile that the Buddha uses, and uh, this has more to do with the dissatisfaction and the impermanence of things. Uh, we could look at it from the viewpoint of impermanence as well, but I, I like this simile, so I'm going to look at it from the viewpoint of dissatisfaction. Uh, and I just taught this simile recently on the uh, retreat that we had down in Anglesey, uh, and it's the simile of the hungry dog. Yeah, the simile. Have you heard about the simile of the hungry dog before? Uh, maybe? Okay, we'll see, we'll see when I... When I when I say it. Uh, this simile is uh, the idea that the Buddha says that the sensual world, uh, the world of the five senses, uh, and our pursuit of the objects in that world of the five senses uh, is just like a hungry dog. A hungry dog, it usually runs up to the butcher shop, yeah, and this was in ancient India, and it sits outside the butcher shop, uh, and it kind of looks into the window, trying to look as cute as possible, so the but butcher will kind of have compassion and sympathy for it, uh, yeah. So it sits there and then hoping for the butcher to throw in some meat because dogs want meat. Yeah? They, 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 this is kind of how they're, they're kind of carnivores uh, originally. Uh, so it sits out that butcher shop waiting and waiting, but the butcher is a businessman. Uh, butcher is not going to throw away valuable meat to a dog. There's no way. So the butcher kind of takes this kind of skeleton of this carcass of an animal, cuts off all the meat, and when all the meat is gone, there's nothing left, then he throws out the bone to the poor dog. And this, of course, all that is left on that bone is a bit of blood, yeah? a bit of blood and a bit of kind of, you can gnaw that bone a little bit, but there is no real sustenance there. There's nothing to fill that dog that is hungry. So that all that happens to the dog, it gets the taste of the blood, and then, of course, when the taste when he gets the taste, craving becomes even more powerful. But because the hunger isn't satisfied, because the hunger isn't stilled, the craving is still there just as much, even more than it was before. So the poor dog runs off to the next butcher shop. Yeah? Exactly the same scenario unfolds as before, waiting outside, more blood on the bone, but no real sustenance. And this way the dog goes on and on and on through its little life. Then the dog dies. And then when the die, what dog gets reborn, how does it get, when the dog gets reborn, how does it get reborn? As a little puppy, yeah? And the puppy has exactly the same problem as the, as the adult dog had in the past life. And it does exactly the same problem, yeah? And it keeps on going like this. And after a hundred lifetimes as a dog, it's still kind of doing the same thing probably. Yeah? It's kind of, it's, it's kind of, you can almost get a sense of uh, repulsion towards that. Yeah? It's kind of, oh, it's almost difficult to look at because you can see the suffering in that. It's very kind of unpleasant. Uh, but of course, the point is uh, that this is largely what we do as human beings. Uh, yeah, this is the problem. Uh, we do exactly the same thing. Uh, we run after the sensual objects on the, on the, of the world. Uh, we run after this thing and that thing. And they never give that satisfaction that we are really looking for. Uh, Notice that, yeah, when you see that craving arises for something, it looks like that craving, when you get it satisfied, it will give rise to real satisfaction inside. 
But look at what actually happens, uh, and you will see that it doesn't. It gives maybe rise to momentary satisfaction, and that satisfaction isn't really profound. It's like a shallow one. The mind is a bit dull or whatever. It's not really kind of anything fantastic at all. Uh, and then soon afterwards, because the satisfaction wasn't anything useful, the craving comes back again. Uh, you run to the next butcher shop. Uh, yeah. How many butcher shops are you going to run to? When are you going to be fed up with those blooming butcher shops? <laughs> It is time to realize that the butchers don't give away any real sustenance. The five sensory world is that butcher shop. It doesn't give any real satisfaction. Yeah, you can keep on running like this. And then when you die because you are in the middle of a project or satisfying a certain craving, you carry on in your next life and you move on like that. And it's it, within one life, it kind of seems, okay, bearable enough. Uh, but if you see that process happening in life after life, uh, that's when it becomes really scary. That's when it becomes intolerable and you've got to do something about it. Uh. So what do you do? So what you do is that one day you find a different kind of butcher. Uh. Yeah, actually he's not a butcher at all. He's just this nice old holy man called the Buddha. Uh. And you come and listen to this old holy man. It wouldn't be good karma to call the Buddha butchers. I kind of got away from that very quickly. <laughs> <coughs> so you got to this holy man and he tells you, you're looking for happiness in the wrong place. Of course there is no happiness in that world. And the reason why there is no happiness in the world is because you have a psychological problem. There is a lack inside of you. You don't really feel happiness. You don't feel content. You need to solve the psychological problem inside of you, not through external things to try to fill up a psychological gap. You have to work with your mind directly. You have to develop your mind. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, if we're going to fill up something that is inherently problematic inside of us, uh, you have to actually develop the mind instead. Uh. So that is where the Buddha says we should put our attention. Uh. How do we do that? Uh, well, the way we do that uh, is by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. You start doing things, like I mentioned before, by being more kind. Uh. And when you are more kind, something magical happens. Uh. You start to feel more content uh, because you start to feel more good about yourself. Uh. You start to be more generous. You do little acts of kindness and generosity all over the place and you feel a bit of joy about that. And when you look at that joy inside of you, it is of a very different type of happiness than the happiness that you get through the sensory world. It is a happiness that gives rise to satisfaction, to contentment. It starts to fill you up inside. That hole, that craving, that eternal itch that is always driving you on starts to disappear. And you feel the opposite, which is satisfaction instead. And then you carry on on this path. And you keep on practicing morality and kindness. You keep on practicing all of these things. And then one day you start to practice meditation. And as you practice meditation, the meditation deepens and deepens. Until one day you find that final satisfaction. That final contentment where the itch is completely gone. Craving isn't there anymore. There's nothing driving you forward. All you feel is joy and happiness inside. And you realize, I have found what I was looking for all along. That's where it is. This is what craving was promising you, but craving could not deliver. You look in a different way, you look to the spiritual path, you look to all of these things, then suddenly you find the answer to the question that you had all along. And you feel 100% satisfied. What that means is that it feels like it is essentially the answer to the meaning of life. The craving that always drives you on, yeah, always searching, you haven't found the meaning of life yet. When craving disappears and you feel 100% satisfied, 100% content, 100% happy, there is no more search is needed, it means you have found the answer to the meaning of life. This is what it's about. Why isn't everyone a Buddhist? This is what I ask. <laughs> You know, it's so, it's so blim and obvious, isn't it? This is what we should be doing. And of course, it goes a little bit beyond that as well, because beyond that is also the insight. But this is the first taste that you have of understanding the purpose and the meaning of life itself, when you have your initial feeling and experience of a little bit of samadhi and deep meditation. So this is what the Buddhist path is about. And this is driven by the idea of Death. Yeah, death is one of those powerful things that kind of drive us in the right direction. Because death reminds us of the problems of samsaric existence. It helps us to turn in the right direction. It helps us to start practicing the path, practicing the Buddhist teachings or the spiritual path in a good way. And it leads to all these beautiful blessings, all this beautiful happiness all the way along. 
your life becomes meaningful, uh, you become a blessing for yourself, uh, and you also come a, become a blessing for the world around you. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh. So f to each one of you, good luck with your spiritual practice, uh, and uh, may you fare on uh, well and happily in this path. Uh. Okay, shall we take some questions? Is that, is that a good idea, Adrian? Yeah, so please, if anyone has any questions, uh, this is a good opportunity to ask. Uh, or if you have a comment or whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to say is okay. We do have three online questions. So okay, please. I've just, yeah, I've just got a comment, um, Ajahn. What I did, um, I did it in 2015 and then I had to do it again this year. When we went go on pilgrimage, um, you have to write a letter. So the one letter was to Ajahn Achilo saying, you know, what if I died, you know, what I wanted to have done with my body, etc. Yeah. And then the second letter is to your family. So I have two boys, so I wrote yeah. two individual letters to them. Yeah. And that, I mean, I'd worked in palliative care, but that was other people dying. This is me yeah. dying. Right, exactly. And yeah. that was yeah. really very yeah. helpful. Okay. It was kind of really yeah. in your face. And um, yeah. I couldn't do the two letters yeah. on the same day because <laughs> it was completely yeah. draining. Okay. So I did them on um, yeah. separate days, but um, that can be quite a useful um, exercise, yeah. exercise yeah. to do. That's very interesting, isn't it? You do things that you have to do because of the situation, and then it actually turns out to be a kind of a very positive mm. Dhamma thing, yeah. And so yeah. then you hand and the you letters to Arjan, and yeah. at the end he hands them back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, yeah. In my yeah. case, no one died on our pilgrimage. Yeah. Okay. Thank was, was you. That, yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, was that good or bad that no one died? Uh? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I always said I, I'd really like to die. But <laughs> I, I nearly died the year before when I fell over and hit my head on marble, and the monks actually thought I had died. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then I yeah. said, "Oh, what a shame! I was in front of the Bodhi tree." <laughs> I just didn't appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'll hand over to someone yeah. else now. Yeah. Bhante, you spoke yeah. about uh, the right view. Yeah. Now, my understanding of right view or understanding is understanding the Four Noble Truths and the law of karma and cause and effect. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You did bring in about mother and father, which I'm aware, but I didn't quite understand yeah. how that fitted in with the right view or right understanding. Okay, so, so the, um, the reason I think it is there is because uh, your parents are a very powerful field of merit, either merit or demerit. Uh, so in connection with the idea of karma and rebirth, uh, I think the Buddha brings up parents specifically because it's a very potent way of making karma. Uh, yeah? So uh, in a sense, what it means is that if you want to progress on the spiritual path, you have to make peace with your parents, you have to treat them in the right way, uh, and it will actually add a big oomph uh, to your spiritual practice. Uh, and that's why I think it is in there. Uh. So, and this is one of the things, you know, one of the things that always is the, maybe slightly problematic about the traditional way of talking about right view, as you say, karma and rebirth and these things, is that it, is, it tends to become a little bit theoretical, yeah? We need to somehow integrate it in a practical way into our daily lives. So what does it mean in practice? So for me, the idea, for example, of thinking about the five sensory world as impermanent and, and always fading away, being subject to... Um, uh, you know, uh, always kind of letting us down in the end is actually one way of bringing right view in a very practical way into your life. Uh, because we know that's true. Yeah, the world outside is always unreliable, always uncertain. It's so obvious to us. Uh, so there's a way of looking at the Four Noble Truths of Dukkha in a very practical way rather than allowing it to be uh, some theoretical issue that is lodging at the back of our minds or whatever. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. We have a few online questions. Uh, the first one here. Could Ajahn please talk about how he helped his father, how he helped his father's funeral be a happy celebration? How I did that? Are you? It's just about how you focus, yeah? It's about kind of the issues that you bring uh, forth and uh, uh, the, the, how you actually reflect on it. And uh, f first of all, as I said, the one of the first reflection is the idea that you. Uh, just remember that your father's life was a one well lived. Yeah, that was what kind of one of the most powerful things for me. Uh, and when you think about your father's life being one well lived, you have a ground for rejoicing, uh, a ground for celebrating. I said this should be a celebration rather than a sad occasion when my father has passed away. Uh, 
This was the first one, the first way of thinking about it. Uh, another thing that I always talk about at funeral ceremonies, and it's a very simple little thing, but it's one that was used by Ajahn Chah sometimes in Thailand. Uh, and he would sometimes hold up a glass. Yeah, there would be a big audience present. This is a cup, but it would be a glass. Uh, and he would say, can you see the crack in the glass? Uh, you, many of you probably heard this simply before. It was very often talk, talked about. Uh, but it's a very beautiful one. Uh, and of course, there wasn't any crack in the glass. Everybody said, no, can't see any crack. And he says, well, it is there. It is there because this glass, one day it will fall down. One day it will shatter in a thousand pieces uh, because that's the nature of glass. It will fall off the table or whatever. Uh, so because we know it is impermanent, because we know it is fragile, uh, we care for it. We look after it. We don't actually just chuck it on the ground like a rubber ball, anything like that, uh, because then you're not really caring for the glass in the right way. Uh. In exactly the same way, human life is fragile. We are so fragile. Yeah, suddenly you die. I mean, I'm, I, it's a miracle that these human bodies work the way they do. For those of you who are doctors, probably know that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many bits and pieces in these bodies, and that they even work to me is like, you know, I, yeah, I'm kind of astonished. So they are very fragile. And before you know it, things go wrong. Yeah, and so we care for each other. And that is the beautiful way of thinking about life. If you think about the fragility of life and that we all die, and that makes you a better person, then that is a wonderful way of kind of making the Dhamma, uh, getting Dhamma out of a death situation. But then I also talk, this is kind of one of the ways that I usually do my funeral service. This is something I learned from Ajahn Brahm. And that is the idea of how you actually focus when someone has died. And uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm normally, normally talks about it's like going to a concert, but he was into concerts when he was young. It can be any kind of very nice experience that you have in your life. Yeah, you have a really nice experience, uh, and then afterwards you can feel two ways about that experience. If it was really, really nice and it kind of lifted up your consciousness, uh, it could be maybe a meditation experience or a, a sensual experience or whatever. Sometimes we feel transported to a slightly different reality by these experiences. Uh, afterwards, you can either think, uh, Oh no, uh, yeah, I lost that experience. Uh, and you can feel really sad about it. And you can de get depressed uh, and sad because you lost a very positive experience. Uh. But the alternative is to think, wow, how lucky I was. Uh. How lucky I was to have a chance. This is my ordinary life. It is so ordinary compared to such a peak experience. Uh, how lucky I was to have that experience. Uh. I can carry it with me. Uh. It gives life more meaning. It has enriched my life in a very positive way. Uh. In, very, in exactly the same way, if you are fortunate, one, fortunate enough to have had a good father, which I did, uh, and many people do have good parents, not everybody, but it's a fairly, fairly common experience, uh, uh, then you think, thank you so much for being part of my life. Uh, thank you for being there and supporting me. Uh, thank you for enriching my experience, for making my life better. Uh, and then, instead of grieving over the loss, uh, you feel grateful for what you have been given uh, during that time together. Uh, it's a very subtle difference. Uh, all it is is a shift of perception from loss uh, to what you have actually gained. Uh, and that makes all the difference between sadness uh, and a sense of gratitude. Uh. So these are some of the ways of reflecting about, about death that uh, you know, we use at funeral services and people usually find it quite uplifting afterwards. Uh, and then of course you have to make sure that the music is not too sad. Uh, if the music is sad, everyone starts crying straight away. So, so make, make sure the music is kind of you know, nice, yeah, even uplifting. Uh, and then you have the, the recipe for a wonderful funeral as a consequence. Uh, okay. <laughs> Is it normal to fear isolation when facing the idea of going deeper into the inner refuge? I always thought we're not supposed to be in an island onto oneself. I'm afraid of disconnecting from others. You, f you feel more connected to others, yeah? If you do it in the right way, you don't feel less connected. You feel more connected. This is kind of the point. Uh, so going inside of yourself, you know, you, when you go inside of yourself, you go with positive feelings. Uh, you have a sense of joy, you have a sense often it is based on, specifically based on meta-meditation, loving kindness and compassion and these kind of things. And meta-meditation connects you to other people. You see the commonality, you see the good aspects of other people. Uh, you feel, instead of feeling isolated, you actually feel connected. Uh. The deeper the samadhi experience is, the more connected you feel to the world around, to the world in general, not to the world around you, but just you feel connected. That's really all. 
And this is kind of the paradox. You know, you live in the forest by yourself. Uh, you go inside of yourself to the rest of the world. You might be dead practically because there's no movement to be seen. Uh, and yet you feel utterly connected to the world. Uh, and that's why people who come out of samadhi, that's exactly what you will hear. They will say that, well, I felt I never felt so connected before. Uh, I never wanted to lose that experience because it is so beautiful. Uh, a sense of unity, a sense of non-self, all the egotism, all that is gone. Uh, a sense of beautiful bliss, uh, a sense of... Uh, wholeness that you never experienced in your entire life, nothing lacking anymore. Uh, these are wonderful qualities, very profound meaning, uh, and you feel the exact opposite of isolation. Uh. Please. Okay, last one. What should be cultivated to inspire oneself to, uh, to meditate as a lay person? Um, uh, first of all, remember that the uh, foundation of the Buddhist path is not meditation practice. Uh, the foundation of the Buddhist path is kindness, it's virtue, it's generosity and all of these kind of things. Uh, so if you find meditation difficult, it may simply be that you need to practice more of these other things first of all uh, to kind of create that foundation that makes it possible. Uh, so you don't have, to, don't have to meditate as a Buddhist, uh, but what you really have to is to be kind, to be do all of these good things. That's really uh, a kind of requirement because otherwise you're not really practicing at all. Uh, and uh, uh, to, if you do that in the right way uh, and you do it consistently, you do it with integrity, you bring in all the various aspects of uh, morality on the path, uh, then eventually there will come a time when you will start to feel your mind settles down, you start to become peaceful and then meditation becomes possible. So it is very closely connected to meditation. You just have to get things in the right order. Huh? And then meditation becomes possible. So the question then maybe should be rephrased. What do I need to do to be inspired, not just for meditation, but to be inspired to practice the whole path? Whether it is uh, kindness, whether it is generosity, whether it is meditation, whatever it is, all of these things need to be inspired into us. Uh, that is maybe, I would say that's a better way of phrasing the question here. Uh, and the way to do that is to contemplate the teaching of the Buddha. The, uh, so the source, the basic thing that allows anything to happen on the spiritual path uh, is the word of the Kalyanamitta, yeah, the word of the Sapurisa, the word of the Aryans, the word of the Buddha. That's the foundation. Everything happens because of that. Uh, so the more you build up this, base, this uh, understanding of the teachings, uh, the more you reflect on these teachings uh, by either reading the suttas yourself, uh, listening to Dhamma that is uh, uh, in accordance with those suttas, uh, uh, you will actually gain that inspiration after a while. You, your view starts to change. Uh, your idea of the world becomes slightly different. Uh, and uh, maybe there is time, I can just uh, briefly just mention one of the beautiful similes in the sutta that I have mentioned many times before since I came here to Melbourne, but it's such a nice one. Uh, and it's the idea that uh, of this mountaintop uh, and the rain falling on the mountaintop. Uh, and as the rain falls on the mountaintop, uh, yeah, and this is kind of the idea of hanging out with the Buddha, reading the suttas, etc. This is the rain, yeah, drawing in that information and understanding and inspiration that comes from the suttas. Uh, and as the rain falls, uh, more and more and more, eventually it falls into little, it forms into little streams. Uh, and as the rain keeps falling, the little streams merge into larger streams. As the rain keeps falling, the larger streams go into the little lakes, and eventually the little lakes overflow. As the rain keeps falling, uh, the little lakes flow over into large lakes. As the rain keeps falling, the large lakes fill up, and then the large lakes overflow into the rivers. And as the rain keeps falling, the rivers eventually reach the ocean. Yeah, all you have to do is to make sure the rain keeps falling. Like this idea of a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. It's a kind of similar kind of thing. You have to keep stepping, keep walking, and keep allowing the rain to fall. And as you do that, this whole thing just emerges and happens almost automatically by itself. That is how inspiration works. Yeah? So keep on reading the suttas. Keep on coming back to the Dhamma. Allow yourself to be inspired. Understand what is going on. And as you do that, suddenly one day you find yourself at the ocean. What is the ocean? The ocean is Arahant, it's Nibbana, it is the highest happiness, the ending of all suffering. One day, bang, you're there. What happened? Gee, all I did was kind of allowing the rain to come down, and now I'm there, yeah? It's kind of cool, isn't it? So all you had to do, keep on uh, reading the suttas, allow yourself to be inspired, and the consequence of that is that one day you, are, you will be there. Yeah?